In this video, I'm going to talk about program construction and how we assemble projects for C++ in Visual Studio. In the last video, I spoke about variables and the four components of a variable. It might seem a little counterintuitive that I would start off talking about common variables and then jump straight into writing actual code. It's because there are a lot of different things happening in the foreground of your source code files, and I want you using your IDE as soon as possible. I'm using Visual Studio 2019, and in my opinion, Visual Studio is the most powerful IDE that you can use for writing C++, C Sharp, and even doing web development for .NET Core. I'm going to create a new project as a console app. Note that I can select the language I want to use and the project type. I'm going to select C++ and console to filter my possible choices. Or I can just scroll down to console app C++. I'm going to call this my first program as the file. Then I'm going to save my solution as S1E1 underscore demo. You can just leave the solution name as it is because it auto-populates as you create the name of the file. Notice that when we look at the files in the Solution Explorer, we have the name of the file that we specified and the name of the solution in a higher position above it. Here you see a file folder and a file with a .sln file extension. If ever you want to open your project from the project file, you can double click on a .sln file and it will open up inside of Visual Studio. Now, I only want to look at two other folders. I'll start with the source files. You notice these lines in green. These are the comments, which means you can write notes to yourself and other developers and the compiler will not see those as code for which it needs to compile. The main function is arguably the most important function in C++, or C-derived programming languages. The best way to view the main function is to really treat it the same way as a table of contents in a book. Every book has a table of contents, which represents what can be found in each of the chapters in the entire book. In fact, you could argue that you get a good sense of what the book is about just by looking through the table of contents. Just like a compiler, I'd like to start at the top of the source code and work my way down. The include directive makes the compiler insert the contents of the file IO stream into the program before it's compiled. This file is called a header file because it's usually brought in at the beginning of a project. This particular header file contains definitions or other source code that are necessary for you to be able to use input and output statements in your program. For example, it lets the user of your application type information into your application. But for now, think of the pound include as a library membership card. In a sense, it is a bridge that connects other files to your current code. In this particular case, we are using IOStream. And notice the two chevrons on either side of the word. In this example on the screen, if we don't include IOStream in our program, it won't compile because we won't be able to access the source code in the IOStream file to make it all work. Typically, when you develop an application that has a user input and output, you will need this IOStream file included in your project. There is a lot more to the IOStream file than we're going to cover here in this video, but just understand that it is one of the most important header files in C++. You should also know that it is referred to as a preprocessor directive, and IOStream is one of several of these. You can recognize them because they start with pound include at the top of your file. A very important concept to note here is that C++ has many of their own built-in libraries of header files. IOStream is just one example. You should know that we don't normally look at the code for these, Rather, we just use all of the tools written within them. However, as developers, we also have the ability to create our own header files, and we will also use the pound include preprocessor to access the files we create. The syntax is slightly different if you make your own header files, and it's wrapped in quotes like this pound include quotes myclass.h. Without it, 
you can't sign out any files from the C++ library. This is a good time to talk about the two different file types we'll be using in C++. The .h file, or header file, and the .cpp file, or implementation file. To use our analogy of a book's table of contents, sometimes books have a table of contents before each chapter as well, much like what you would expect from a book about C++. That would be your .h file, which is there to tell your compiler what to expect from the cpp file. The cpp file is literally where all of the chapter text is written. We call this the implementation file, where you implement all of the details of what you said you would do in the .h file. I should highlight the fact that the file containing the main function is a .cpp file and has no .h file. There is not a main.h file. I'm hoping that you notice the main function does have what we've referred to as a return type. And in main's case, its return type is an integer. When we get to functions, this will become much more clear. But for now, just understand that every function does have a return type. And main is no exception because its return type is an integer. Before we leave the main function, let's talk about all the code inside the curly braces or the code block. Notice that each statement ends with a semicolon. Let's look at it an example of how we would go about using actual variables in our program. I'm going to declare and initialize some variables. These are referred to as local variables because they fall within our current code block inside of main. I have several different options I can use when declaring variables. For example, I could say int number one equals 10 semicolon int number two equals 20, semicolon. Int number three equals 20, semicolon. Int number four equals 40, semicolon. These are on the same line, but because of the semicolon, the compiler reads them as being separate. Another way I can do this line is to only type the int once and separate the variables with a comma. Int number three equals 30, comma, number 4 equals 40, semicolon. Double number 5 equals 45.5, semicolon. Notice the decimal point. Char letter equals A in quotes, semicolon. We covered that in the last video. Const float pi equals 3.14 F, semicolon. Notice the difference of using std colon colon in our code. If we don't have using namespace standard semicolon, I get an error under my cout statement on line 17 when I remove std colon colon. However, when I add it back, the error goes away. There is a more efficient way to correct this. If I add the statement using namespace standard, I no longer need to write std colon colon cout. I just use cout. Notice the double chevrons. This is part of the IO stream library known as the extraction operator. On line 21, I'm going to print the value of the variable number one to my console. On line 22, I'm printing all of my variables to the console, plus hello world and number one. There is some formatting syntax there but we'll bypass that for today. I'd like to circle back and mention the keyword const for a moment. I've used the variable pi for a very specific reason in order to properly explain this const keyword. The reason is that pi, as you know, is a constant number that doesn't change. It's typically illustrated as 3.14 and doesn't change. Because it is a universal constant, we add the const keyword so that it can't be changed later in the code. If I don't use the keyword const, I'll be able to overwrite the value that we assigned to pi. For example, if I write pi again, notice I didn't use the data type the second time. That's because I already created pi above. Because the original pi is a const, I get an error when I try to assign the second pi a value of 100. 
if I remove the const keyword, I'm allowed to overwrite the original pi. The const keyword protects the variable pi from being overwritten somewhere else in your code. If not, who knows what pi would equal. I'd like to take this opportunity to create my own header file and assemble it with the project. While I'm not going to write any code here, I want to show how all the files are connected. In the header folder, right-click and select Add Class. As you give it a name, it will auto-populate the same names for your header.h and implementation.cpp. Here, I'm calling it My Class. The way I connect the new files is by using the pound include file in the file that my main function is located. Like we talked about before, I'm using the pound include statement as a library card to get the book I want called myclass.h, as seen here as a new preprocessor statement in line 3. In the next video, we're going to tackle one of the most complicated concepts in C, and that is the pointer. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.